I have experience in my marriage. I've been married for 41 years, and I get this lesson every day. <laughs> I'm a slow one. Uh, I, I don't like the fast. <laughs> well, but but still, uh, my husband's name is Johan, and I have noticed when I address him, Johan, I all almost always say the wrong things. But when I address him, the Son of God, then I see that I am speaking from my heart. And uh, when I say, uh, oh, you are, uh, uh, it's time to do that and that. Say, oh, couldn't you say that in other words? Why are you so angry? Why, uh, 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 uh. Oh, well. <laughs> and then I notice, I know I'm listening to the wrong voice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But I want to do it. Ha -ha. Uh, and, and I do it uh, until I realize. Mm. Oh, no, this is not the right way. And then I check. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so, so, That's so, yeah. so, uh, Very descriptive. Yeah, uh, so I, I see. I'm in command. Uh, I, I choose the, the voice I want to listen to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Quite powerful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, for a couple of weeks and of life and uh, then choosing <clears throat> to get into this realm of being once again or you know back to the world of physicality <clears throat> and, I, and I just related to it um, why do I choose once 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 am I, I'm in a blissful state of total life and love and then I choose to go back into this into this body believing it's all sorts of mm -hmm. illusions mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do I make that choice? Again? Why the choice? <laughs> and, and, who, and who am I to make that choice in that moment? Because that, in that moment, I'm, I'm not really, I'm no one. I am just, I'm, just, I'm no one. So, so, so I'm not really, yeah. it just yeah. seems like, thunk, back here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it feels like it's just happened. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a part in the back of the course, the clarification of terms. Originally, I think it was supposed to be at the beginning of the book. You put the clarification of terms at the beginning of a book, but they stuck it at the end. Where Jesus says, um, the ego will ask many questions that this course has no answer for. Uh, how did the impossible occur? To whom did the impossible occur? That's a version of... Who, who is it that's making this choice, too? And can this, this one be known, and so forth? And he says, there is no answer, but there is an experience. And he says, there is an experience that will come that will end your doubting. So, that's good to know right away. With all this book of concepts, that it's not like there's going to be a concept that's going to come and go, aha, I found the concept. I found the... The Holy Grail, you know, the Holy Grail of concepts. I found the, the mother load of all concepts. I found it, you know, it's like, it's not going to come. But there is going to be an experience that will come that will bring an end to doubt forever. And so basically, he's saying, seek for this experience, you know, desire this experience and trust that everything you need to have this experience will come to you. Now, the scribe of The Course in Miracles, Helen Schuckman, she was scribing in shorthand notes, taking this down from Jesus, starting with, this is A Course in Miracles, please take notes. That was the very first thing that he said to her. And they got through, her and her collaborator, Bill Thedford, who was her boss, they got through so many chapters, and they just said to Jesus one day, could we just ask one small question here before we get too far with these chapters? How did this happen in the first place? Which I call the number one question, you know, people always around the world are asking that one. And Jesus said, well, you can tell by your emotions, like this emotional roller coaster ride that you're on, that you believe that it has happened. So already he's talking about the belief realm. Like, you believe it, and it seems to be real for you, even though it's not real. And so, 
basically the way I've addressed it is, when we ask the question, how did the impossible happen, or to whom did it happen, or who is making this decision to, to go from bliss into hell, who is the one that's making this decision, underneath the question is an assumption, and of course the assumption is that it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you wouldn't ever ask the question, you couldn't ask how did it happen, <laughs> unless you already assume one important detail that it did happen. Hmm. So what Jesus is saying is, it never really happened. But I've got a, hmm. a book that is in words, because you believe in words. There's no words in heaven, but you believe in words, so we're going to use words. He even says that words are symbols of symbols, twice removed from reality. Hmm. You know, so the word just is a symbol for the thought. And the thought's not even real. You know, we have a word called table, we have a thought called table, but there is no table. Or if some of you have seen The Matrix, there is no spoon. <laughs> you know, the little kids. So basically, we have to get into a mind training program that will dissolve the question in an experience. Where you have miracles, and more miracles, and more miracles, and your mind gets more and more trained to think habitually with God in a miracle state of mind. And they're still perceptual, so it still involves synchronicities, and oh, I can't believe I met this person, and oh, I can't believe they called just at that time and told me that, and you know, all those kind of wonderful synchronicities. You need lots of those to prepare the mind for revelation, which is pure light. It's just, it's not even a perceptual uh, experience at all. In fact, nobody can talk to you about revelation, because it's, it's not transferable with words. You know, like when people have a near-death experience and they talk about maybe going through a tunnel or seeing relatives, and then when they get into this light, they say the words fail. They, they use words like telepathic and universal, unconditional love, but they say the words are so crude, you know, for this experience. So, what you do is you, you start to say, okay, I'm not going to try to figure out that question. Because the ego is asking the question. <laughs> the spirit is not asking how did the impossible occur. Because the spirit knows it didn't. But the whole book is aimed at the atonement. Mm -hmm. And the atonement, which is the correction, is the awareness that the separation never happened. Mm -hmm. What does that mean in practical terms? It means that no matter what the script is showing you, you are not fooled by the images, you know. In fact, with Jesus, the script showed at the end, you know, as a, a man strung up on a cross, that if any of you have seen Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, it, from the ego's perspective, it was a bloody mess. You know, whipping and blood splattering everywhere. I went to see that movie with my mother, and my mother was sitting a few seats down, and when the blood started to really splatter, I could just hear kind of these gasps. <laughs> like, like, it just was, this is someone that the Christians look up to, you know, and worship, really, Jesus. You know, it was a bloody mess. And so it brought up a lot of guilt feelings and a lot of shame for people around the world. I, I was going to Argentina, and the Holy Spirit said, watch the movie, because they're going to ask you a lot of questions about the movie, and you, you better have seen the movie so you can talk about it. So, so in the end, you keep opening to these miraculous experiences, and when you get into this miraculous state of mind, you realize that all things work together for good. That really, the Holy Spirit can still come through you with helpful instructions, with reminders, with things that will still come through you, but you, you have no investment in an outcome, uh, because when you let go of the ego, you're no longer concerned with the outcomes of the world. Peace of mind has become your outcome. We're used to thinking of outcomes in terms of form. How did it look? How did the story end? How did it turn out? We want to know what's the picture look like. And he's saying, you'll never be happy as long as you want the picture to come out a certain way. But, 
if you release your expectations, your attachments, and get so into the Holy Spirit's purpose, that you'll find that you're in the present moment, and that everything's perfect, and always has been perfect. You just didn't see it. Mm -hmm. Your perception shifts, and you realize, oh, that's what they were talking about. In the Bible, all mm -hmm. things work together for good for those that love the Lord. Really, for those that are in line with the Lord. And in A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, all things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. Mm. Now there's a phrase that I've talked about for many years that's in, the, that's in the workbook. And it says, Jesus says, the script is written. The script is written? That sounds pretty definitive. That sounds like destiny. Uh, you know, for years in philosophy, people have been saying, how much choice do we have? Do we have free will? Is things, are things determined? Can we really change things or, or not? And I've explored it in the Course, and what Jesus is really saying is, He says in the clarification of terms that free will is what you were created with, but your free will is for perfect happiness. And then he says the striking thing, he says, there is no free will in this world. Oh my goodness. No free will in this world? No wonder I didn't have perfect happiness. <laughs> there, there was, maybe I was looking for it in the wrong place. Maybe I should have been going within to the kingdom of heaven to find my perfect happiness in meditating and sinking deeper into my consciousness instead of looking for it, as the country song says, looking for love and in too many faces, looking for love in all the wrong places, you know. Maybe I was looking for it in form, and I was always disappointed, because it was never meant to be found in form. Hmm. That when I was young, people would say, oh, it's God's will that uh, that country got invaded, or it's God's will that that plane went down, or whatever. And I used to think, that's kind of, doesn't sound real good. God's will that a plane crashed, you know. It's God's will that he was on it and he died at that moment. You know, oh, what is, is God is telling people when to die? And, and the, Jesus is saying, no, no, no. God's will for you is perfect happiness. Mm -hmm. Even your function in this world, people say, well, what do I need to be? Do I, do I need to be a scribe or a teacher mm -hmm. or a prophet or a healer? Mm -hmm. that's, that's just the form. All God wants for you is to be happy. But, but it's a happiness that comes from within you, not because you got the raise, not because this outcome turned out the way you wanted it to. That's more ego happiness. And it's very temporary. I mean, all of us have got, we've had some successes where we went, yes, finally, finally I got what I wanted. But it's very short-lived. It's very temporary. Then we're on to the next conquest, or the next pursuit. And the ego keeps shifting the goals <coughs> So that we'll keep grasping like for happiness and always never letting us you know, get it. It's very frustrating on the human plane because you come so close sometimes and yet it's like, who, who is moving the marker? I, was really, I thought I was really close that time. You know, but it's like you can't, you can't get there. So he's saying, the sooner the better that you start to realize that the happiness is within you. So there was a a family therapist in the United States called John Bradshaw, and he used to make funny things on the chalkboard about relationships. He, he would say, a typical way people look at relationships is one half plus one half equals one. You know, when people say, oh, I'm searching, I haven't found my other half yet. <laughs> or sometimes people will even say their better half, or whatever, you know, it's <laughs> whatever. It's half, half, half. And he, John Bradshaw was a family therapist, and he wrote it, one half plus one half equals one. And he said, you know, the only problem is, it's not an addition sign there. It's a multiplication sign. So one half times one half is one fourth. You feel less. You get involved in the relationship, you feel worse than, than before you got into it. You feel like a quarter of a, of a person. And you think, what did I do wrong? This is supposed to bring me happiness. But then he would say, okay, keep the same multiplication, but one times one equals one. Come from your wholeness. Come from your 
sense of being in your source, being in line with God, being intuitive. And then watch how that manifests and that, and that reflects in the world, in your partnerships, in your friendships, in your relationships. I went from being a shy guy that was over in the United States that was voted most quiet, and now I seem to have all these friends all over in all these different countries, and we have such a good time. We really, it's a very joyful time. We get together and we laugh, and, and even when someone's going through some dark stuff, you know, there's, it's very nurturing and supportive. There's no trying to figure it out or to put, point the blame or anything. It's just, it's very, very nurturing. But that all comes from a shift in consciousness, where you just say, okay, I need an experience to show me who I truly am, to show me my wholeness. And what I have believed in the past has not served me, and it has not got me to where I, I want to be. I want to know my wholeness. So it, puts, it turns it around so that when you start to ask questions, Instead of asking the question, how did this happen in the first place, which is the ego just spinning its wheels, you know, hoping that you'll just get caught up in those kind of things, which really have no conceptual answer, you start to turn the questions in on the ego. When you feel irritated, upset, annoyed at somebody or something, you start to say, hmm, what's going on with my perception of this person or this event? What is it that I don't like about them that reflects what I still believe about myself, or about that's still in my awareness? You start to see that people are more like mirrors than these autonomous creatures with minds of their own, that think on their own and act on their own. I tell this story <coughs> of, a, of a man, a, a friend of mine, he was a, a Course in Miracles, he, he got involved into a Course in Miracles, him and his wife, and uh, their daughter was, was murdered, I think she was in her early 20s, and he, they opened a, a, a healing center in her name, uh, and I spoke at that healing center, and they ended up doing all these attitudinal healing groups and Course in Miracles groups, and he went through such a healing process that they caught the man who, who had murdered their daughter, and he went to the prison, and the Spirit guided him to go in there, befriend this man, and write a book about healing. And this man was in prison with an artist, and asked the man to put the, art, the illustrations in his, his book on healing. I mean, that's the way the Holy Spirit guides you to, to really, really release the grievance. And it was such a great healing, and him and his wife were married for like 30, 32 years, and I went down to visit him one time, and he just looked at me, he was devastated. His wife of 32 years had left with another man, a younger man, and moved to Greece. Uh, he said, David, all these years of forgiveness and everything I've ever done, all they seem to go out the window. I have envy, jealousy, rage, I, I, I have hatred. I'm going along thinking I'm cruising along and that we'll be like on the movie On Golden Pond, you know, we'll be with our white hair just rocking on our rocking chairs hmm. and, and holding hands and saying, well, we really handled that ego, didn't we, and everything. You know, all these visions, and now she goes off <laughs> with a younger man and moves to Greece. He was, he was just, oh, he was all tied up. And, and I, I finally looked at him and I said, Jap, I said, we have to talk about a few things. I said, because he's like, he, like he had a dagger in his heart, his sweetheart had left him after 30 years of marriage and all the healing, and it felt like he was just twisting the dagger in there. So the first thing I had to do was like grab the dagger and go, wait a minute here. People are not people. They're just reflections of your thoughts. So let's start taking a look at this. And he's like, okay. And I said, tell me what was going on before she left uh, for Greece with this younger guy. And she, she said, well, she said, she, she's about 10, 10, 12 young, years younger than me, and, and, but she, she started to get very concerned about aging. He started to have wrinkles. He was about 10 years older. He started to get wrinkles, 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 and she started to get a little nip, a little tuck, a little plastic surgery, you know, to prevent the wrinkles. And I said, what was, what was she acting out for you? What was, 
what was that thought for you? And she, he said, a fear of, of aging? I said, very good. <laughs> she was acting out your fear of aging. He's like, wow. And then I said, and then, and what's behind that? He said, I don't know, a fear of, of dying. I said, aha, there you go. She was acting out your fear of dying for you. And, and so we went through it as if she was a character, that she was acting out his beliefs for him. So he could get in touch with his beliefs. Because he talked about feeling abandoned, rejected, he felt them all. And then he was like, the more he talked, you know, I said, well, you know, she still loves you. Nobody goes through all that you've gone through. But this is all just playing out so that you can look at what you believe and, and release these beliefs and heal. You want to go back to God. So we spent some time talking and he said, I said, how do you feel? Oh, kind of lonely, isolated in this <clears throat> big house now by myself. And, and I don't know if I have to go back to work. I'm retired, but I don't know if I can support myself in this big house. I said, yeah, let's be practical. Do you really need this big house <laughs> for just you? And he's like, no, no. So I took a walk, met some guy who wanted to who was looking for a house in that area. <laughs> so let's move quickly. <laughs> so I, I got the guy home. And then he said, and I'm depressed. My sweetheart's gone. It's lonely. I'm isolated. And everything. I said, I said, well, don't you, you've been doing healing work for all these years. Where are all these people? Well, they're all around in Florida. I just haven't seen them for a long time. Let's get on the phone. Let's have the biggest party uh, you've ever had in this house. If you're going to let go of the house, let's light this place up. So we got on the phone. He had bunches and bunches of friends. We did a big gathering. He brought a, a woman along. He said, well, this, she's got the potential to be my new girlfriend. He brought her, invite her, bring her, get your, invite your family, you know, and we just had a big celebration party. We also talked, I said, what is it that you really want to do with your life? And he said, well, I write these fiction novels, little short stories that are very metaphysical. I said, well, show me some of them. They were great. He writes these great metaphysical short stories. They're so inspirational about how to heal your mind and how to release attachments and all this and this. I said, he said, I just never had the time to write them. Mm. I said, well, it's like you got the time right now. <laughs> and then we were, had some quiet times together too. He, I said, now if you could do anything, if you could do anything in the world right now, what would you do? And my friend was from Mississippi southern part of the United States, and he said in his southern Mississippi accent, go fishing, <laughs> go fishing. I went, ah, that's your meditation. Mm -hmm. You don't have to sit in the lotus position, you don't have to breathe in certain ways and this and this. <clears throat> when you go out there with your buddies and put on those high boots and stand out there, and you're having so much fun and you're feeling connected with God, <clears throat> that's your meditation. That's the form that it looks for you. You don't have to do yoga or tai chi or some of these other forms. That's your form, out in a creek bed and with your buddies fishing, and you're feeling connected with God. And he said, that's right. That's why I want to go fishing. <laughs> so it was like the Holy Spirit just worked through me to kind of pull the dagger out and say, no, no, no. <laughs> you're perceiving that the worst possible event has occurred in your life, but it hasn't. This is part of the script of you going back to God. And all you have to do is, is be open to take the steps for your joy and your happiness. And it turns out he ended up, I found out he ended up getting remarried, the girlfriend, the potential girlfriend, he ended up getting remarried. I think they sold, they sold that house and moved to another. You know, he moved on. He didn't stay in resentment, anger, jealousy, envy, <clears throat> you know, all the typical judgments, self-judgments that were just like killing him emotionally, you know, it was like, no, you can, you can shift. So that's how it works. It's like, no matter what the event is, there's always a higher interpretation, which is the Holy Spirit's interpretation. Now beyond that, I'll give you a clue of where this is all going. There really is no such thing as linear time. I mean, it's totally a fabrication of the ego. When we're younger, we go to history classes, they draw the timeline on the chalkboard, with little arrows. They start off with all these events and they put a little dot and they call that the present moment. And they teach us that the present moment is between the past and the future. That's not even true. Uh, it's a whole fabricated bunch of lies. All of history. 
One time, Jesus was talking to Helen Shuckman, and he said the most astounding thing. Jesus said to her, history would not even exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake, repeating the same mistake over and over. History would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake over and over. Oh, oh that gets my attention. Tell me more <laughs> about this mistake that he says is what? Healed? The world was over long ago, that he's already accepted the correction, that, that the Holy Spirit has already solved the puzzle of this world. It's already over and done, and I'm still reliving this crazy tiny man idea over and over, and I'm making up history as I go along. All of history is just make-believe? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so that's why you need the training of A Course in Miracles, for example, because he says at the beginning of the workbook, we need to introduce new time ideas. Because these old time ideas that you have are driving you crazy. I mean, you're really, really, you're like living in, your, in a hell that you've made up because you're playing by these old time rules. Some of you have probably read channeled writings that talk about uh, parallel lives. It's, it's simultaneous. All of time is, is simultaneous. It's only the ego that strings it out and puts one image and one event before another and makes up this whole belief system that time is linear, as if it's going to take time now to go back to God. You think, how many lifetimes, how much inner work do I have to do? The ego made up the whole thing. There's an astounding line in The Course in Miracles where Jesus says, the ego likes the idea of return to God. I had to stop a minute when I read that one. What? The ego likes the idea of return to God because the ego can make the, the idea extremely difficult, <laughs> frustrating and difficult. <laughs> you, he's like saying, you don't even have to return to where you already are. You just have to have the experience of what you already are and where you already are. You know, in the kingdom of heaven, you don't even have to return to something that you never left. So he keeps planting little clues in the book. <clears throat> he says, this is a journey without distance to a goal that has never changed. Mm. Ah. I went back looking at the Bible. I said, maybe he said some stuff 2,000 years ago about time. He did. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, that's fascinating grammar. Fascinating grammar. Before Abraham was, I am. The present moment is before time. It's not this little blip that's mm -hmm. squeezed in between the past and the future. The ego wants you to believe that it's just this little blip squeezed in front of the past and the future because it wants you to downplay it. And it, the ego teaches that the past is full of guilt. The present moment is this tiny little beep, mm -hmm. blip of nothingness that's covered over. And now the ego says, you're going to make the same mistakes that you made in the past and the future. Mm -hmm. And that's why some Christians talk about burning in hell. Because they they follow the ego's theology out, and that's exactly where it leads. If you're guilty in the past, you've got no power in the present to make a change, then you're condemned to the future. You know, that's, that's part of that old fire and brimstone mentality, burn in hell kind of thing. So, Jesus is saying, no, no, the present is before time was. Before Abraham was, I am. He was teaching it back then, that you can free your mind from illusions so much and work miracles, you know, have miracles performed through you, and more and more have states like Jenny was talking about, where it was like timeless, where you, you start to forget about time. And some of you know the term amnesia. When you have amnesia about an event, you forget about it. An amnesia about your identity or something. This whole cosmos is amnesia about love. You know, look at it. I mean, the wars, the conflict, the disease, you know, the, the everyday stuff that you see on the news. Anybody who, who would say God created the world, I don't care if they've read it in the Bible or how many years they've had it preached to them, you know, if they stopped for a minute, they would go, well, God really must have messed up if He, if he created this world and it looks this way. But maybe the ego invented this distorted world oh. as a device to keep the mind asleep and forget that it's Christ. 
forget the divine love. It's all, linear time is part of a trick. And time is very relative. I mean, I travel to all these countries, you go through different time zones, I, you know, when we talk on the internet now, it's like we call, oh, I'm sorry, it's what, what, three in the morning there? <laughs> Nobody can keep track of all the time zones and everything. But it's really just an invention. In fact, we were in Australia, and we were on this plane. This guy is sitting next to us, and he's got his cell phone, he's going, he said, it's crazy. Time is crazy. And this is not a Course in Miracles student. This guy just started off talking about time. He said, time is absolutely crazy. He said, he said, let me tell you what. He said, I go home and I land. And he's, his house is right in the middle of two different states, uh, you know, provinces or states in, in Australia. And he's right on the timeline for the cell phone plan. So the part of his house is an hour different <laughs> than the rest. If he makes a call from the front of his house, he can get major charges, bills of hundreds of dollars, than if he makes them in the back when he's calling during the free time, you know. If he makes a call from the wrong side of his house, he gets huge bills. He said, this time thing is crazy. He said, this is crazy. He said, you walk along my neighborhood and you can be in this time zone or that time zone and the cell phone's going <laughs> and he said it's a, such an invention and I said yeah this wasn't even a Course in Miracles student just just to someone who was just observing the, the insanity of it and in fact my mother was always trying to send me birthday greetings but a couple years ago she always likes to be on time with the birthday greetings you know with email or phone call or whatever but I had flown to Australia so I had crossed the date line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she called me from what she thought was my birthday. I said, you're a day late. <laughs> I'm sorry. She said, I am not. I said, well, actually, it's like, I'm, I'm, you're talking to me. I'm in tomorrow. <laughs> but that's, that's when you start to fly to Australia and New Zealand. You do. You cross over the date line. You take off. You fly back and have... You take the off day the ever. longest day ever. You you fly over there. You you take off and you land, and it's two days later. You land the, the plane lands, and it's what did I do? Did I drop a, a whole day somewhere in the Pacific Ocean? And then when you take off from over there, you take off, and it's morning of whatever the 11th, and then you fly fly to Fiji and over Hawaii, and this, you get to the United States. You go into the United States, and it's still the same day. You've You've been flying for hours and hours and hours and hours, and it's still, it's the longest day, really, literally. But, but that just shows you how time is such, a, such an invention. Mm -hmm. And when human beings put so much faith in it, then they get concerned about being late. They, they're concerned when they get early. Am I too early? They almost have to, you have to apologize. Am I too early? Am I too early? And if you're late, then that's a big guilt trip. You're late, people are saying to you. As if, you're guilty. Hmm. Wait a minute, who, who invented this, this thing? In South America, they got a whole different standard than up here. You know, I say the gathering will start at 7 o'clock and maybe by 9.30 or 10, <laughs> they're just beginning to, to come in for the gathering. And it's like, oh yeah, well, yeah. You know, it's almost accepted that there's like a two or three hour grace period <laughs> with starting something. So, you know, it just shows with different cultures, it's totally relative, you know. We don't have to get so stressed about things. When people talk about relationship issues, health issues, economic issues, uh, issues with the environment, with governments, with society, time is at the bottom of it all. And the sooner you start to realize it's a time issue, then the faster you can be free from all of it. If you start to realize that linear time is at the bottom of it all. You think you have problems with your children, or your parents, or neighbors, or whatever. No, it's time. It's way down there. There's a movie that came out, it's in my Movie Watcher's Guide, called Dark City. And it's, it's like if you took A Course in Miracles and you put it into a full-length motion picture, that would be like what Dark City is. It's dark, uh, because this world is dark, uh, and, and the more you see it, it's all telepathic, and the whole whole constructs of projection, and one of the characters decides that he, he needs to wake up. 
And so he starts going through this wake-up experience, and he's very frustrated, but all the other ones are sleeping. And he's starting to wake up, and he starts to get these telepathic powers, and psychokinesis powers, and so forth. I showed this movie one time to a Course in Miracles group that I worked with for years, and it was so deep that the whole group fell asleep uh, during the movie. And these were Course in Miracles students. Uh, they were like, somebody zoned out. But when I took it down to Columbia, some of these places where they've had civil war, kidnappings, drug cartels. Uh, oh, where's your, where's your husband? Oh, he was murdered uh, back in such and such a year. <laughs> uh, where's, your, where's your son? Oh, he got kidnapped uh, a couple of months ago. <laughs> oh, imagine, you know, you're having these conversations. They really are into A Course in Miracles down there. There's like somewhere between 50 and 100 Course in Miracles groups in Buenos Aires, Argentina alone. They, they want the real Christ. They're tired of this hierarchy of popes and cardinals and bishops and old sacrificial theology of punishment. Oh no, that, they found out that didn't work a long time ago. But they were desperate for the truth, for Jesus' message of my kingdom is not of this world. I'm calling you out of the world. Yeah, think about it. If you were living in a society where there was murders, rapes, kidnappings, drug cartels, where the buildings had bars all over them so to prevent vandals and everything, you know, that might accelerate the work with the Course in Miracles a little bit because you would, you would start to say, I'm not going to be fooled by the fluff of this world anymore. Love doesn't make this world go around like the romantic song says, it's guilt. Guilt spins this whole cosmos, it spins this whole world. And the sooner you start to see that and go inside, you start to get in touch with the real love that's inside of you, and then you, you just want to just radiate it, you know, to everyone, you know. You just want to just share it. You want to do anything that will save time for everyone, you know. Your whole life becomes a, just a, a mission of, of grace and of love, where you just want to share love with everyone and, and shorten time, you know, for everybody make them have an experience where they can see that it's just a trick. So, <clears throat> I've actually been invited uh, in South America to a school to speak twice to the children of the school. Uh, it was a school that was founded on the principles of Gurdjieff. Uh, so the whole school was founded on the principles of undoing the ego. So I had to laugh. I said, well, that makes sense that if I got an invitation to speak at school, it would be the school for undoing the ego. They were all very attentive, very taking notes. You know, so they weren't throwing paper and running around. You know, they were like, oh, this is important. You know, 16, 17, 18 years old. Imagine being 17 and you've got your whole life before you and you don't know what to make, what sense to make of the world. And then you get a teaching that says that linear time isn't real and that you can work miracles and escape from time. They're like, Okay, let's get going here. <laughs> let's get started. Let's get busy. That's exciting for me to see people, young people, with their eyes sparkling. Or doing, I show a lot of movies. I was in South America and I was showing this one movie called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind with Jim Carrey. It is such a deep movie. And Holy Spirit was ripping through me with all this commentary and everyone got happy. There was a quantum physicist that was there. There was these young people. Imagine people, young people that are dating. Maybe they're 18, 19, 20 years old. They come down after the movie. And they're holding hands with this glow in their eyes because they realize that they're not destined to a life of struggle like their parents had. That they can understand these ego dynamics that are trying to ruin their relationship. And I just have spent the last two and a half, three hours, giving all the ego secrets away. Ah, it's going to try this with you and this, but be ready. Watch out for this and this and this, and this is the real purpose. They're like 18, 17 years old, but they're so happy because using the movie I've been able to explain in graphic terms how to, to avoid falling into the ego's trap with relationships, which makes them feel like hell. Anybody who's gone through a relationship that's really dark knows it's just, it's like it rips your heart out. But it doesn't have to be that way. I took the same movie to another part of Colombia, then over to two parts of uh, Venezuela, 
And I was showing this movie in Venezuela with lots of, of commentary. And this, at the end of the movie, this woman came up to me with tears pouring down her face. And she said, David, I've been studying the Course for 17 years, hoping for one experience of God's love. One blazing experience, knock your socks off, you know, without a doubt God is real. I've been hanging on, doing my workbook lessons, practicing for 14 years. And then in the middle of your movie, ah, she was there crying. She was like, God is real! God is real! <laughs> she was so happy. You know, her life will be changed forever. You know, one experience like that just opens up, gets the ball rolling for, for many, many miracles. So to me, that's, that's a beautiful thing. I, I, I see how the Spirit can use movies and music and gatherings like these in many, many different ways to reach you in a way that you can hear it, in a way that you can accept it. That the Holy Spirit knows your belief system, knows your preferences, knows all your ego tricks, and knows a way to get through the defenses and to reach your mind and just shower you with love. So much love, like high voltage love, that, you know, that just keeps you just floating, floating all the time. So for me, it's, it's regardless of the form, it just feels like joy. I have met so many people, I have my phone numbers on the internet and Skype, I use email, I try to make myself really, really accessible. And then when people contact me, that's why I go places. I go, that's how I came to Sweden. Anna invited me to come to Sweden. She thought it very strong. She said, we should invite David. And that was it. Uh, then, it's been, that was back in 2005, I think. So, so I've been coming. We even have a peace house established. Uh, well, Anna always says her house is a peace house, too. <laughs> with six children in, too. That's a real <laughs> interesting peace house. And you can maintain the peace with six children living around. But we have one in southern Sweden, in Tar, too, uh, that's kind of growing a little bit too, so I plan to keep coming back there and <clears throat> doing retreats, longer retreats, and you know, where we sit around and we watch movies together and eat together, maybe meditate together and take a walk. You know, over here in Europe, uh, we've already got a, a little peace house going down in Sweden. There's one over in Belgium. It's not like the Catholic Church, and right? I have no goal to try to start peace houses in every country or, or, or whatever. We don't have vows. We only have two guidelines at our peace houses, no people pleasing and no private thoughts. So you don't have to take vows of ch poverty, chastity and obedience. <laughs> you just have to be willing to, to just lay it all on the table and to trust that there are people there that love you and trust you enough that they're not going to jump on you and, and criticize you for your private thoughts, but they're going to be part of the Holy Spirit's plan to show you that those private thoughts aren't real and that you're innocent, and that you're totally loved and accepted. And it's a great feeling, you know. It's, I guess you enjoyed that about coming to Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah. The deep sharing thoughts and uh, really helpful. Breaking old patterns, mm -hmm. like even, even now you still will have a hesitation, but then mm -hmm. you'll say, mm, you know, might as well put it out there. Yeah. And it's, it's not that private thoughts are bad, you know, no private thoughts, but Jesus is teaching, you have no private thoughts. All the thoughts in your mind that are real, you share with God. And you share with the Holy Spirit. So that's what we mean by no private thoughts. Tell me more about the practical peace house. What is it? Well, it's... I, over all these years of teaching and sharing and putting stuff on the internet or whatever, there have been people that have have said, oh, I feel your love and your joy, and I want to, I want to join with you in purpose. We're not teaching anything about special places, special people, uh, darshans and vortexes, and all the typical things that go on spirituality. We're saying no. Like the Course says, the holiest spot on earth is where an ancient hatred has become a present love. You know, whenever we forgive, that's that's holiness. You know, that's the remembrance of holiness. So, people come in contact with us. Uh, we were just down in southern Sweden at a cow farm. What was it? Fas, fas, yeah, Vestra Vigod. Yeah, a small little place. Yeah, Ulla, and she had us at the cow farm. I think the second time I was there. And 
and we had a, <clears throat> a beautiful gathering, and then four people just came up and said, we want to come and visit you. And I said, well, that's fine, then you can just email or write, come for a period of time, maybe come for a retreat or whatever. It's just to open, it's just symbols, letting the symbols be used. There's nothing special about any house or about me or about anything. It's just symbols of starting to give yourself permission to open up and to, sometimes people come and they just pour out their hearts. Uh, a woman I met in France, she, she said, to, she met me and she just started crying and crying and crying. And I, I said, what's, what's the emotion about? And she said, when I was 22 I had this experience of union with God and with love and with oneness. And she said, I've slowly drifted off into the ways of the world from 22 on to 40. So when I met you, I recognized, I remembered the joy and I'm mourning and grieving my sadness for having allowed myself to drift off into bitterness, into darkness, and close my heart. She said, I can even remember the exact time when I told God, okay, you're not going to give me that relationship? I'll show you what a closed heart is. You know, and, and going down this spiral of feeling isolated and lonely and whatever. Then she met me and she was like, ah, I remember it. I, I can see it in your eyes. But I'm sad, I'm grieving. So she said she wanted to come to the Peace House. She didn't have any money. <clears throat> Some man donated her a round trip ticket so she could come over for 11 days. She spent 11 days with me. We went to restaurants and just had, drove around Cincinnati as backdrop, talking about things, working through. After five days she said, uh oh, I'm, I think I'm too dark. Uh, I'm not, it's not happening, nothing's happening. I said, well, you still have six more days left, don't, <laughs> don't, don't shut off the process yet. And then finally, around the <clears throat> tenth day, she started to get more, and the bubble started to pop. The emotions started to come up, we were talking about, and she started to feel the sadness and allow it to come. <clears throat> and then, it, she broke through the bubble when she, we went to the airport when I was taking her to get her on the plane back to France. She, she just popped through this big, dark bubble. And when she got back to France, she just kept sending emails of all these miracles. She was, she was working at a job with, at a law firm that she hated. She despised going into work every day. She went in and they came to her and she said, no, I quit. She quit her job. And then her severance pay was five times what she thought it would be. And her unemployment check in France was about as much as her paycheck. And she was like, I'm getting paid to study A Course in Miracles again. <laughs> she was like writing these emails. It was just the next step for her of releasing these limits, these deep-seated beliefs and unworthiness and limits that she had placed on herself and starting to see that she was deserving of love. And then we just visited her and she took us up to Mary Magdalene's cave and a channel came to her house and did a reading for everybody told her she was married to me in a past life, and she was really like that, she said. <laughs> I said, hey, how, how's my ex-wife doing? <laughs> but, you know, it just, it just gets happier and happier when you just start to, when the bubble pops, you can start to feel a lightness come in. And she didn't even know if it was possible. But I said, oh yeah, don't worry, God is, is very powerful. You just have to have the willingness to turn, and then things start going the other way. <clears throat> We're all in this together, you know, this is like, this is precious time for us to come together and expose these ego tricks that have kept us bound and guilty for so many years, seemingly, in the dream. And now it's time to, to have a wake-up party. Somebody was asking me the other day, they said, are you going to come back for another life? I said, no, this is it <laughs> for me. <laughs> It's like the Truman Show. Good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> good night. <laughs> you can't say good riddance though, because when, when you have this experience, you see that it, it never happened. You know, you, you, you don't have a grievance. So it's not like, thank God I got away from the grievance. You don't make it to heaven and tell your war stories. <laughs> you, heaven is the awareness that there are no war stories. So, you know, it's, it's really very, very joyful to, to give yourself over to this experience, because then, <clears throat> I mean, I, I feel like really honored to 
not have any grievances. I mean, I, I go around, I get to meet all these people, and even when someone's talking to me and saying something like, emailing me or saying, oh, I went to one of your gatherings and I didn't like it, and I was disappointed, and da 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 When you start to feel all the love in your heart, and your only desire is to really extend the love, then all you see are opportunities every day. It's like a flood of opportunities to share love. You know, when I was with, <clears throat> traveling a few years ago, and a waitress, I could tell she was very nervous. She was walking around and she was very nervous. And I finally, I said, is this your first night? And she said, yes, this is my first night and I'm very nervous. I'm, I'm really scared. She said, and so when she came back around <clears throat> to take the order, I said, listen, I said, I'm going to make an order here, but you can do whatever you want. If you bring that food here and you come late and you dump the whole, whole plate of food in my lap, I'm going to give you the biggest tip that you've ever had. Or she was just her, her first day of waitressing. Well, not too difficult to do. But anyway, <laughs> but she, her, she just smiled as soon as I said that, because I was basically just teaching her with symbols. You can do no wrong. You know, your presence is so beautiful. You don't have to be concerned about the waitressing. That'll just come. You can do no wrong. And then she, all of a sudden she got so confident, she looked like she was been waitressing for 20 years, you know. She, everything changed. But it was a reflection of my mind that I was seeing her happy and whole and confident. And she flipped around right away. In fact, I, I have a story that I sh sometimes share. I have a friend who's a Course in Miracles teacher. <clears throat> he was just recently over here in Europe. And during 9-11, when the towers, Twin Towers came down, about 11 days, 11 or 12 days after the towers came down, he and a group of Course in Miracles students walked into Ground Zero. They walked into the city. And it just had happened 11, 12 days earlier. So you can imagine <laughs> what they were walking into. He was in such a miraculous state of mind, and he was in total joy all the way in. And then when he got in really close, he saw a little short Japanese man who had a little checkered uh, sport coat on. And the Japanese man, his head was down, <clears throat> he was going, so terrible, so terrible. He seemed to be what the world would call in, in deep, deep grief. And my friend, who was a miracle worker, had the thought whisk through his mind, what if my joy could be an affront or an insult to this man's grief? And as soon as he had that thought, which is an ego thought, as if there is such a thing as, as grief, he smelled all, he felt the heat, he smelled all the dust up his nostrils and his ears. He suddenly was aware of all the surroundings that he was standing in when he fell out of the right-minded or the above the battleground perspective of being with the Holy Spirit. And I said, what did you do? He said, I called out, Jesus, help me. I need, I need to get back in my right mind. He called out for the miracle. And he was able to very quickly get back up into the miraculous state of mind where he could come back up and be in alignment. And then he said, the funniest thing happened. He looked, he was back up in his right mind. He looked and the same Japanese man turned to him and looked him right in the eye and said, in kind of a rhythmic rap nature, like rap music, I can see, by the way that you feel, that you know that none of this is real. <laughs> I smile on his face. And I, was just like <clears throat> I said, wow, that's a, that's a shift in perception, perception, from grieving to that kind of a witness. But that shows you the power of the mind that everything you witness is a reflection of where your mind's at. So if you change your mind, you, that's how you can see a happy world. Not by trying to, you know, solve the world's problems, which are in the billions and trillions, one at a time, but by actually taking 100% responsibility for everything that you perceive, and just saying, okay, I got some cleaning to do. I got some major forgiveness to do. I watch the news. Okay, I got some. I got some work to do. One hundred percent responsibility for just being mistaken and being open to the spirit to to show you another way. And it's there. You do see another way. You see the world 
from a different perspective. Jesus had to see a different perspective when he, the body was on the cross and bleeding with spikes in his arms and legs, and he said, forgive them for they know not what, what they do. You know, that would have been a very inappropriate comment from somebody who was suffering on the cross, like the ego would have us believe. But he had transcended the body, he had transcended guilt, he had transcended pain and suffering, and the world was simply a movie for him. He had, he had freed the guilt in his mind. He had resurrected, long before the body came out of the cave at the end, you know, he had resurrected uh, prior to his public mission, he had resurrected his mind. So if you meet some Christian friends, you can just tell them, well, the resurrection occurred before the crucifixion. Let's see what you know. And then just explain, it's, it's the mind, the consciousness raised up into purity and into oneness. I and the Father are one. That's not a man speaking. <laughs> before Abraham was, I am. They were ready to stone him when he let that come out of his mouth. Like how, you young whippersnapper, you know, you, Abraham, all of our traditions, and you're saying, before Abraham was, I am. That was like fighting words. But the ego couldn't understand. He was just giving the simple truth, you know, of pure innocence. So it's good. You, you, all of a sudden, it all starts to come together. It all starts to make sense. Those things that you, you know, were perplexing. I used to, I was raised a Christian, but I didn't like that, that line in the Bible, I am, the, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I, I was like, oh, you know, people in China that never have heard of you, and it just seemed to be the most exclusive kind of thing. And then I was on a plane, and Jesus was saying, that was the Holy Spirit speaking. That was just the, the universal inspiration that's there for all of us, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It wasn't a man speaking. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so angry at you for that, that line. It was just, again, my misperception of who was speaking. You know, from a man to a, a spirit. You know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, of course. It starts to make sense. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, just need to ask. Oh, um, oh, Okay. <laughs> it's so much of all this that does make sense to me experientially, but the story behind it is kind of um, something I don't understand and I wonder if you can explain it a bit more. How come that God created Christ, if I understood it correctly, uh, in a way that he could have this kind of dream. Yeah, that's addressed. In fact, yeah. you know, everyone's somewhat familiar with the biblical story, Genesis, you know, where it said, you know, God created man in his likeness and image. But, but if God is spirit, and God created man in his likeness and image, then that means man must be spirit. Uh, the ego has turned that around and has made up its own God <laughs> in its own name, in its own image, a fearful God, an angry God, a punishing God. But, but basically it, it comes around to this thing of, in the Genesis story it said that Adam and Eve were in paradise with God and that God said, whatever you do, don't eat the fruit from this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Which to me, again, you have to see this is all just symbolic. Good and evil is duality. If God and paradise are perfect oneness, uh, then it would be like, don't take a bite out of that tree, because once you start believing in duality, you've got love and fear, and heaven and hell, and a mess, you know, but it's an illusion. So in A Course in Miracles, <clears throat> Jesus says that, that God didn't have anything to do with that tree. <laughs> so, God didn't, because people would say to me, why would God put such a tree in the garden? Exactly. Darn him, he should know better. If he's, if he's a perfect creator, he should never have put that tree there. You know, And that apple looking so red and right. You know, no, he should never have done that. But no, it's, Jesus said, no, that's a metaphor for the, 
for the knowledge of good and evil is for duality, but God didn't put that tree there. God created a perfect being, and God only knows that perfect being that he created. In fact, that perfect being, Christ, God gave everything to Christ, all the skills and abilities of creation, not in form, but in spirit. He gave all of his creative abilities to Christ, so Christ even has creations. And of course, in Miracles says that we have creations that are waiting for us to wake up. It's almost like having long lost children that you've never met. <laughs> that Christ has creations that are so wonderful and beautiful as spirit, but, but we can't know them as long as we're asleep and dreaming. So, the teaching is, is that God knows only spirit. <clears throat> God creates only in spirit. And God and Christ are really living in the same mind, except they really are one spirit, except there's only one difference. That God created Christ, and Christ did not create God. The ego jumped on that. He said, do you want to be number two? Oh, you come with me. I'll show you how to be number one. <laughs> you, you don't have to settle for a second class uh, citizenship of being only the Christ. I'll take you to a place where you can be the kingpin, the queen. You can make yourself any way you want, and you can keep doing it as much as you want. You can reinvent yourself over and over and over, as any way you like it. And, and that's what the ego's trick is, you know. It's like, come with me and, and push God out of the picture. The ego says, you've already separated from God, You'll, he'll never let you back. So now you better settle and compromise for this. And this is what the dream's about. Now, God, there's a great line in the Course where Jesus says one sentence in the Beyond All Idols section, he says, God knows not form. Wow. That's a pretty powerful uh, sentence. God knows not form. People, I've heard interpret that, people will say, oh my God, he doesn't know about us. Well, it's the us part, that's what we got to get clear on. I mean, these little pieces of flesh that are, seem to be so important, you know. Uh, if people get all sad and weepy, he doesn't even know about me. Well, believe me, there's a much greater realm than, than the, the world of time and space. So God knows Christ, and Christ has creations. Now the Holy Spirit is simply a, a symbol of a bridge back. So the Holy Spirit remembers God, and also remembers Christ, but also is able to work with illusions, because the Holy Spirit knows they aren't true.